only cedar I like is one's got a tree stand in it. That's a, a or on a border between properties as a screen. Those are the only two cedars I like. When you read the early explorers, a lot of people know I like to read a lot. Uh, uh, a lot of people went through the Ozarks. The White River is right down there in that big valley you're seeing. That's White River Valley, uh, Tabrock Lake, all that stuff. Uh, a lot of trappers and whatnot went up to White River, and a lot of them kept journals. So we we're blessed right here to have a lot of different eyeballs pre-settlement days. So we know what it looked like when God was managing. And uh, they rarely talk about cedars, and they ne I've never read one that mentioned a tick yet. And you will mention ticks if you live here now. And that's because we had a we had a savanna habitat, a tree every 100, 200, 300 feet, something like that. A lot of fire, thousands upon thousands of turkeys and quail, and ticks just didn't have much a chance. So yeah, I'm not cedars. About 40% of the moisture that hits the cedar never makes it to the soil. It either stays in the tree or evaporates off. There's a lot of negatives with cedar. Oklahoma has a big cedar problem, and they think they're losing about 700 acres a day. 365 days a year to cedar encroachment and that's statewide that's not in one farm obviously but statewide so yeah cedars are an issue justin why do you just write in here you know the first little bit the thicker timber what's your basal area just give you a know, ballpark because we talk all this stuff but we don't give examples that's i'd say probably 90 but you know ba can get kind of screwy with you when you're talking small trees can can kind of get goofy and great big trees can kind of yeah. get goofy but but it's definitely crowded yeah i was gonna say 90 100 in there but yep. what i look for more we use ba to communicate in my world what i'm looking for is my canopy and i don't have any sun coming down this is not commercially viable timber so what I'm looking at is what can I do? So I need to, I'll come back in, probably kill 90 plus percent of the hickories. That's my first target. They're easy to identify. They're not, they're not fitting my mission. See what that opens up. And then if there, you know, some elms and other stuff like that. And then I'll start looking at what oaks survive and what don't survive. I think that's where we talked about, you know, take those small bites yeah. too. You know, if you come in here and you say, I want to pull it down to a 50 BA, uh, or if you, you know, sometimes we look at leaf area index, which is which is basically just the science way of doing exactly that. Hey, I've got a bunch of shade or I don't, but um, you can get open in a hurry. And then if you're following it up with the burns, well, you've just laid that much more fuel on the ground. Whereas, you know, like Grant did here, he pulled the cedar out, get it on the ground, we get a fire underneath it, and then you come back and say, well, we're going to pull some more out. Then you can get real particular on species selection. You know, I. Hey, I want to pull down the amount of hickory, or I want to pull down the sweet gum, or I want to pull certain things out. You can start taking those out of the system and get back to what you want. But the cedar, I think, is always first. And once you hit about 40% cedar coverage, it's almost unburnable. Yeah. It, it becomes out. a fire break. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Stays out. But again, that food plot looked just like across from you because we'd already cut the cedars here. That is extremely low wildlife habitat, deer, turkey, quail, whatever. There's just no food there. And the food plot's gonna, even though it's yucky soil right now, gonna produce probably more than a ton or two per acre of food if we keep getting some showers every now and then. And this probably will get up to maybe 150, 200 pounds per acre somewhere in there. And it, but this is really drought resistant. We did 70 acres, you know, now that's not true. We had a crew fell all the cedars. We made fire break. We had a lot of sweat equity in this, but we converted all that in one day in a burn. So 70 acres at 100 pounds per acre, just easy math, gives you quite a bit of food. We're four acres at more, you know, this is gonna give me more food out here in the long run. We're gonna harvest more deer right there because in the winter when this hardens off, they're coming right there. I mean, they're definitely coming there. And I will end up, Tracy's probably most likely gonna have a house right there, and then right over there on that edge, I'll have a redneck blind. I hope that buck doesn't step out to her that I'll probably wake her up. She's a late sleeper, but yeah, I will. The deer, we, we had a food plot behind our last house, and man, there were deer out there every day. There's this condition to the dog and, you know, us and our activities. They just totally condition to it. They look up, you pull in the driveway, they will condition to a particular truck. Stranger pulls up, they run out of food plot. We pull up, they're like, oh. 
grand again. Where are they bedding? Are they bedding there coming here to eat? Well, when it's really hot, they may be bedded over there in denser shade, but a lot of days they're bedding over here because they can browse their way in here. This is like a giant staging area. Yeah, they can browse their way in here. This is going to be super high quality habitat. How far did you burn down that hill? Did you create a fire? All the way up to the next ridge top. So you made the fire break on the next the yep, 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 there, yep, 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 okay. yep. Not suggesting that for everyone. We're really comfortable with fire. Had right conditions for this unit. Did you burn all that in one go? Yeah, three of us one day. Yeah. You hear some people talk about leaving these skeletons and stuff for bedding habitat where you pop on. I'm on the internet. That's internet garbage. Mm -hmm. I mean, they will. They're bed there, but they'd rather bed in three foot tall ragweed, native grasses, or whatever. Don't you agree, Fred? Uh, yeah, I, it's just. If I said, which is honest, man, we work in every state east of the Rockies. We don't do much west of the Rockies. And we've made some really good friends. Some of y'all are here, my friends, we've helped. We've made really good friends in a lot of places. Daniel and I pretty much got a punch tag for any state we want to hunt. And I said, man, I like you. We've had a good time today. Uh, why don't we go hunting together? What state you like to hunt in? I'll make a call and get us a place to hunt. Any state you want. Where would you say you want to go? Whitetail hunting. That's important to go on for a especially with new plots. I don't know, I got pretty good stuff there in Oklahoma, so I like that place, but I already live there, so let's just go with one of the big ones like Iowa. Okay, Oklahoma, Iowa, either one. What do they have in common? One and a half miles an hour. Chris, tell, tell, yeah. tell us about Just in general. Plant. You started planting, you made a great yeah. comment for Grant. Right? Uh, Grant. Mm -hmm. A lot of sun hitting the ground. <laughs> Folks, it's all about photosynthesis down here where deer live. Zero, three feet, zero, four feet off the ground. In a closed canopy forest, most of the sun's energy is up there. What did you eat for breakfast this morning? Sausage. Sausage? What you really ate was photosynthesis, because that sausage was made out of an animal that ate photosynthesis. We all eat photosynthesis. We just don't think about it. I eat a lot of photosynthesis, but we all eat photosynthesis. And so when I'm photosynthesizing, you know, just rough number, 50, 60 feet above the ground, the bulk of the photosynthesis, I don't get much groceries. Acorns, little window to ear, low quality food, high in energy, low in protein. Uh, out here, I'm getting photosynthesis right where deer lives. To get cover where a deer, quail, turkey live, you need photosynthesis zero, three feet off the ground. This is not cover. This part right behind me here, right? It's bare, like we can all see. Any coyote running that creek bottom because there's not obstructions or smelling any fawn or turkey nest up through here. But zero three foot tall prairie states, so where I'm going is prairie states. Iowa, Oklahoma, Indiana, Ohio, Wisconsin, Michigan. Little house on the prairie, Minnesota. Big deer come from prairie states or places like Fred Place, Fred's property where he's really managed well. A lot of times that will save you a large I have one comment to the question about cedars. You kind of said you like your cedars with a deer stand. For me, I've got one purpose for cedars in my place, and that's a visual screen around the perimeter. Stop people from being able to road hunt. People can't see what's in there. They're not invited to come and say, I can see what's behind that screen. But if it's in the middle of the place, I'm nihilistic. We cut them all. Because if you leave one standing oh, yeah. three years, you got lots of little cedars all around there. So I, I just. We just get rid of them all. If you can't burn a lot, you leave one cedar, you will have more. Those babies are prolific. Why is there more cedars under a, a power line or a fence road than other places? No. Fence roads usually have a lot of cedars in them. Why is that? The birds dropping seeds. Yeah. Birds eat seed and poop them out right there. The birds plant them right there all the time. Yeah. No, I, I'm not in love with cedar at all. At all. Grant, build off the skeleton question. What about hinge cutting? I mean, what's your thoughts on that as far as cover and benefit? <laughs> so that started way up north. I know the guys that started it way up north. They were in, one the insurance salesman, one something else, and they made it big. And it's an easy thing to do. You get a chainsaw, you fill some trees, see deer browsing. Oh, I did some good work today. You know, I did some good work today. I don't want my deer eating toothpicks. I want them eating alfalfa quality food. And then some idiot, you can quote me on that, I don't care, come out with hinge cut and head tall. 
Would you let your crew lose a chainsaw head tall? No, your insurance company would do backflips over that. Right. Yeah, I mean, if that tree kicks off that stump, it's going right here. You're not going to survive a four inch tree hitting you in the jaw. You're not going to survive it. People literally die every year in America doing hinge cutting. It's the saddest thing. And then you hinge cut, you'd say, successfully. And in two years, because of photosynthesis, anywhere south of Canada, those limbs grow up so tall, deer couldn't feed on them anyway. And they say it makes cover, you just shade it out the ground. You did exactly opposite what we're talking about. I have a client that, you know, bought into the, the cookie sauce and did some hinge cutting in Kentucky. Now he has to use a dozer to clean it up. Your fire won't clean that up, it's all shaded out. That's yellow equipment cleaning that up. Now, hinge cut one tree to make a deer walk closer to that <laughs> tree over there to get a bow shot on. Yeah, you're making a little screen or something, I get that. Hinge cutting 50 acres, man, that's a mess. And yes, deer will eat some ends of a maple tree. Do you want to meet in the ends of a 40-year-old maple tree or a one-year-old sapling that's really high in protein? So I'm not a hinge cut fan, and it sure makes a mess. And some scientists just actually released some work that showed that fawn survival in hinge cut areas is much lower because a fawn can't run through all that crap, but a, but a coyote can. It's just a death trap for fawns. So no hinge cutting here. And I'm not mad at anyone. I just hate it when people pontificate on stuff that's inaccurate, not scientifically based, and people buy into it, and then there's, 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 no, there's no recovery from hinge cutting. Anymore. And then they also say maintain it. Let's say this was a hinge cut, whatever, maple. How you gonna maintain, you gonna cut every limb, hundreds of limb on one tree to, to maintain that? Yeah, no, impractical. it's impractical. So it's, it's not a good tool for me. I got a question back to the uh, basal area. Yeah. Um, so I'm in Virginia, Pine Belt, Loblolly Pine. Yeah. I'm guessing the age of these trees are maybe 25 to 30. No, nah, no, nah, no. Nah. Okay. These are real old. This is the Ozarks real old side index. Okay. <laughs> I would not be surprised if that bigger oak right over there is 120, 150 okay. years old. Yeah, yeah, I'm clueless on that. Just different environment. Yeah. However, this being approximately 80 basal area of hardwood and the crowns are so much bigger, if you had 80 basal area of Loblolly pine, you'd have a ton of... Uh, that's right on the edge. I like the thin pines. I get a lot of variables in here. Age of stand. There's so many variables. But yeah, so I'm, I'm thinking 20 year old pine. I, I, if I'm in it for producing income, that's my primary objective. And my secondary is wildlife habitat, which that may fit a lot of landowners, right? They need to pay for land, pay for kids' college, whatever. I'm thin into 80, 90, somewhere in there. I'm, I may be contrary, and there are a lot of guys that think differently than me, but to be honest, I think nowadays, be, because we, we're we not growing 40-year-old timber anymore, we're harvesting 25-year-old timber. The mills want this. Right, chip you know, you don't, you don't, yeah. you, you don't build it, you know, Grant's about to build a house, and I bet there'll be a rare 2x12 in there, maybe on your stair treads or something, whereas 20 years ago, we used to build 2x12s, used to be everything that spanned a two-car garage, used yeah, yeah. to be every living room had 2x12s over it. Now those are glue lambs, or those are uh, manufactured trusses, and so the mills want to make 2x4s and 2x6s, that's it. And so we're only growing them this big, so to me, even if I have a landowner that is a commercial timber owner, does not hunt, doesn't care, he says, I want trees from fence to fence, I thin them to a 55 or 60 at the first thinning. But pine pulpwood prices are in the dumps right now. Right. So, I mean, I'm looking to thin some myself here soon, and uh, I'm thinking of thinning it down to 55. So the, the acreage I'm talking about was previously thinned was approximately 80 to 90. I mean, I basilar. love thin. I, yeah. I love 50, 60. I love it. If I'm on the pine side, I may need a little more, just not. Just and I both grew on this. If you go from DC to East Texas, you know, around the, the Piedmont, Coastal Plain area, that's pine trees primarily, due to government programs back in the day. There's more pine out, we can't get rid of pines. We have clients can't even give pine away. So there's a, Justin's idea is, which I agree, even plant it thinner to start with, and grow trees, bigger trees faster, get some wildlife benefit along the way, because if you plant that typical seven half by seven half, it's not just the pulp woods in the dump now, it's in the dump for the foreseeable future. Absolutely.
So you might as well do something different there. But that does help you move it though. If you know if you're you know, a lot of the challenge now is not just how much money I get paid for the pine timber, it's can I even get rid of the pine timber. So a lot of times we're marketing and we say, well, hey, everybody else is going to take it to an 80, but we're going to take it all the way down to a 55. The logger says, oh, well, I'm going to get 30% more. I'm going to move my equipment, but I'm going to get 30% more wood per acre. But you just got to be selective. Don't let them take the good ones. Right. Make them take yeah. the junk. And, and just know that when you do thin it down that hard, all that sunlight makes great food on the ground, but also grows brush. So we got to implement a prescribed burn plan. Yeah. Like you got to get going with it. And burning and, is and a maybe process, even a herbicide a with it. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. How many live in pine country here? Small minority. So you can talk to us later about that. Uh, but pine management. Pine sands could be wonderful wildlife habitat. They are not a desert at all, managed appropriately. I mean, incredible. I would say much easier to manage than this and probably more productive. This is not pine country. It was originally, this was surely pine country. And early settlers took that out and hardwood brush come back. The bottoms, wetlands, bottoms, north facing slopes were hardwoods. Everything else was shortly pine. Daniel's going on, man. <laughs> Well, the gentleman made a great comment. Pine, pine is so much easier to burn. I, it, it loads you up with fuel and it's fine fuel. You know, pine in the system is the same as grasses in the system. I mean, it, it just cooks. It's fantastic. It's such a winner, uh, which is part of the reason that, you know, we manage a lot of mixed pine hardwood. And we do get some landowners that say, oh, I want all the pines cut out automatically. I don't want any pines. Well, you know, pines don't take up a lot of sunlight. They do not they do not disrupt your leaf area index by a whole lot. You can keep some pines out there and they contribute just enough fuel into the system. It's almost, if you think about when you're burning, you think about the old pixie stick game. You know, you take the sticks and you drop them and they would all be kind of interlaced. That's what pine straw does. To whereas if you take hardwood leaves, they lay flat and then they get wet and it's like the old phone book that got thrown out in your driveway and then it got rained on and it's wrinkled and wet. And you can dry it out, but the book still doesn't open correctly. That's the difference between the two. So if you can, if you have just a little bit of pine to mix in there with that hardwood, man, the burn just goes so much easier. I love leaving some component of pine in the system. I hate seeing it taken completely out. Okay, so uh, this is obvious, right? Cedars were failed and one burned nothing no management actions I, i'm pretty sure looking at old aerial photographs in this county right here we have 1951 aerial out of an airplane the old stuff so it's lower resolution but this was all pasture 51 then they let it go they lost it so you're looking at trees 70 80 years old somewhere in there and cedars are you know an invasive species they encroach readily so that look like that turn around that being north or to your other side over here across the road you're a deer and you eat zero to three feet off the ground see how much green is already coming up below there and that is not thin enough we talked earlier we did we cut all the cedars we do a burn that's kind of like putting your base layer on the canvas now we get a smaller brush out and start fine-tuning that and take out the trees we want to take out, reducing that basal area. Next burn will be more aggressive because we removed a bunch of fuel and we're burning a little hotter and take out more to cedars. Also, now instead of just leaves, we're going to have grasses, fine fuel in between there. The fire will carry a little bit better and be a, more, a little bit more homogenous versus hot, not so hot, hot, not so hot. Over here, this is what I call, I think I may have coined this term, biological desert if you make a living zero three feet off the ground there's just not much in there food or cover if you're a turkey hen sitting in here and if you do this i know it's embarrassing but put your butt up your head down you can see a long ways in there it's like cover for you and i to walk in there we're getting slapped in the face but down where critters live it is wide open so just running a fire through here, 
you know, I don't know, it may kill a few small trees, but it, you would remove some fine fuel and accomplish no, kill a few ticks, no other objective would be accomplished. A, a reasonable fire. I don't even think you get a major rager carrying in there too much shade. So just wanted to show a stark comparison here. And I'm going to, Justin has no idea, has no script, but Justin, I'm going to hire you to do some work for me, which is true. And you're going to kill all the cedars. That's, and, and then you're going to make a fire line and burn it. What's that cost a guy? Just talk, give us a range. Probably $400 an acre, ballpark kind of number, to get from this to that over there. Probably, you know, ballpark in that number yeah. to do the whole thing. So that's felt, the labor of felling all the cedars by hand, mm -hmm. and, then a, and then making fire line, and then burning. Right. All right, so there you go. Now I know, now you all know, roughly. How many steps would that take? I mean, uh, if you started that today, when is it going to look like this? Uh, I mean, you can get there pretty quick. Okay. I mean, steps wise, though, I mean, say, you know, there's a lot of stuff we do in the field that my automatic answer is going to be 12 months because there's some seasonality to that, right? And we've got to let some of that fuel get in a state that we're ready to burn. But like in here, uh, like Grant had said, we could come in and burn it. Like we could probably make it go through there, but we're going to get nothing from it. Wait, wait, I can't get enough heat from that fuel load to hurt anything that's there. Right? And so that would actually take us a step backwards. So just like was done over there, we want to cut it first. We got to get the cedar on the ground. We're going to use that cedar to contribute to the heat of the fire. Now that does mean there's some jackpotted fuel. There's some stuff in piles. There's other areas that don't want to burn real well. But you know, if you look at the sunlight coming to the ground, and I bet if we went out there, there's probably a lot of forbs, but I'll bet you money there's a lot of grasses that are starting to come up and that stuff takes time. You know, it doesn't just happen overnight. I don't think you did any seeding over there, right? That no, was no, just no. what's coming yeah, up yeah, natural. Yeah. So, you know, it, it takes some time, but the more we burn, the more we're gonna promote that herbaceous layer down there. And that means more fuel for the next fire. You get a better burn, it promotes it even more. So, you know, you can kind of work through these we can either have a positive reinforcing cycle over there, or we can keep this negative reinforcing cycle over here. You know, if you're, as your composition in cedar gets up high in a stand, you can't do anything with it. It will actually become almost fireproof until, until we're talking catastrophic wildfire type weather, you know, California kind of weather. Um, but, but 12 months, say if we come in here, Let's say we showed up next week, we took all the cedar down. In this particular stand, because we're in a market for it, you could take out all the merchantable wood that you can find if, if there is any in that particular place, get it all out of the way, let it sit on the ground, come back and burn it in the winter because we're focused more on fuel reduction, right? hazard reduction, so we don't want to get too hot. want to let all that heat vent out of the top without leaves on the canopy we don't want to build too much heat and you'll be you'll be right there and that, that's 12 months you know and we're right here again what's so the next step right here what's going to happen next you're going to start getting sappings up or you're going to have to uh, yeah we're getting a few but we will burn that probably next summer when there's more fuel mm -hmm. and hopefully we get a summer where august somewhere near july august we can run a fire through there and in between then, if I get time, I may go through with the hatchet and some herbicide and take out some trees, open up a canopy more. Do you see a point where you're gonna have to deal with herbicide though with, with uh, Not in there, I can, th th those there. species of oaks, I can burn that hot enough and I'll burn a lot of summer burns and I think I'll keep those hardwood saplings at bay. If I do, it'd be a spot treatment. So those woods over by Tracy's patch were 80 or 90 basal area, what, what is that? Just for comparison. I'm gonna put my number here and he can put his number there. I I was gonna guess 65. <laughs> 70. <laughs> okay. So I said That's 70. I meant this place. So y'all are hurting me. <laughs> <laughs> so this is I'm sorry, this is an example, Grant, where you would fell these cedars and burn them in less than a year, just to, to reduce the fuel. Sometimes, I just knowing site-specific information here, depending on time of year, I fell them. 
if I fell them later and they don't get to dry enough that first summer, that's a two, I call it two years, year and a half, two year cycle for me. Uh, if, if you have small cedars, these will, these needles will wick out moisture. If you have a cedar this big, I like to let it lay for two years and I still won't get good consumption, but I'll burn more of it. I, I'm all about reducing the cedar load as much as I can. So pin on time of year, sometimes you gotta go that extra season to get it dry enough. So when was this cut? That was cut two years ago. So it's two years. Yep, uh, year and a half, Ray, year and a half. Did you get the same results by hack and squirt? Uh, you can, but felling cedars is pretty quick. Sometimes you get cedars with limbs to the ground, it's hard to get in there and hack and squirt and all that. I, I think a chainsaw does good work here. Uh, Going to hurt your other trees, right? Oh, the leaves are off. You, I mean, if you had, just just say this is a premium oak here, yeah. and five or six of these dry cedars right at the base of it, that's going to build up a lot of heat, and you may or may not harm that tree. Depending on the wind conditions at that moment, a lot of those factors. But cedars don't stump sprout either. Whereas cedars other, don't stump sprout. So you look out there, I mean, I see a couple of dead trees, but not many. And by this, this was later in the afternoon, evening. And Daniel and I were putting head fires in here. We were tired and grumpy and wanted to go home. It would barely, by the time we, we started almost at the blacktop road you drove in and spent all day working this way, just three of us. And the time we got here, the humidity had peaked up like you're talking about, and I couldn't leave it smoldering. So we zigzagged a lot in there and hit some hot pockets, probably hit a hot pocket over there, and just try and get it black so we could leave it for tonight. And then the first thing the next morning, Someone walks the whole perimeter looking for stumps or logs smoldering that we can put out so it doesn't build up during the day. Because I've seen a lot of fires kick up two days later. You got to get them out. That's called mop up. But, but even in the hot spots you get, you know, even if you like, like let's say that pretty good pile right there, and if it had a hot spot, it killed a couple trees right there in that view right there close. You know, that's okay. Oh yeah, that's great sunlight to the ground. That's gonna do something growth-wise a little bit different than somewhere else where maybe it was thicker. So I don't, you're not hurting a thing in the world. If you have a couple hot spots and a hardwood stand, it's not, it's not hurting a thing in the world. You I know, think it's an improvement because it's a yeah. mosaic. It's not a monoculture of through there. It makes a, you know, deer will use, turkeys will nest, you know, brew different places. I think those mosaics are much better than a, everything exactly the same. Yeah, and it, as you continue to burn, you'll find those those mosaic pieces kind of move around on you. You'll find an area that, like let's say, uh, say Grant comes back in June and burns it. Well, that spot right over there, because it's getting all the sunlight, it might have a ton of green fuel. And so when they come in, it's all green grasses and it doesn't want to burn in June or July or August for them. But then it it's growing fuel. So it has twice as much fuel as somewhere else it's been burned. So the next time he comes around, that spot might burn hot again. So you're even when you burn, you're gonna get this mosaic. Not everything will be black. You know, you should not expect, especially summer burns, you should not expect oh, yeah. your burn to be just this black everywhere. It all looks exactly the same. It's gonna be, it's gonna be spotty and that's okay. That's, that's really frankly better than all black and those spots will move around on you and you're, that's entirely effective. I think even more so than just having it solid black from one end all the way to the other. Uh, one last thing I'll say here, uh, even more to me than a you know big whopper buck, uh, watching this change, as Justin said, and the process of going from that to that, and the wildflowers in there and the different species, is extremely rewarding to me. Extremely rewarding. Uh, big deer are a byproduct of this. Uh, but improving the habitat and watching the ebb and flow and the changes and seasonality is something I've just really, now that I'm a little bit older, really come to appreciate and learn from. Owning my own land and making mistakes here has made me a much better consultant. Much better than I was from textbook knowledge. Much better. So we burned this three times being data. I think we missed a year, four, so four years. four years we burned this three times, and it's still an ugly forest. That's just an example of what Justin and I talked about last time. We burned this, Daniel actually burned it while I was out of town working this last time. Uh, pretty hot, because we burned as much, not much fuel in here, so you can get away with a pretty fast moving fire. 
Uh, and it's still a closed canopy, junky trees. Killed some young stuff, killed a few cedars, a few little saplings, but without getting some sunlight down, fire, the tool of fire has limited value. It's not probably a lot of ticks in there, and, but no fawning cover, no nesting cover. Uh, and I'm just leaving this little eight, 10 acre block, just use it as a demo for that point. Maybe I'll change my plan someday and do some hack and squirt. But look across the road and look down in there further. Don't look right at the edge of the road. I don't like to kill a lot of trees right on the edge of road because you end up chainsawing them out of the road. So I don't want to hack and squirt or girdle trees right on the edge of the road because they're going to fall and inevitably they fall in the road because they've been reaching for sunshine over that gap in the road. If you look down this edge or that edge, there's more limbs on the road side than the other side because they're reaching for sun. So if you kill them, then they, you got to cut them out away, or Tracy does or somebody does. If you look down in there where we hit it a little harder with fire and there are more cedars, a lot more green. Actually, Daniel took a video the other day of a couple of does eating down in all that green stuff down there. And we're going to come back and hack and squirt this more and thin it out and probably will someday open this up, make it a pretty savanna, oak savanna area. And then right behind me, this gentleman, yeah, right there, point it out to everyone, right here. is a hickory right next to an oak. And done appropriately with the hack and squirt or double girdle, I could take that tree out and not harm the oak. Cross-species trees, oak hickory, will root graft, but not near as common as a white oak to a white oak or red oak to a red oak. And some of these herbicides, like the mazapir-based herbicides, are ground active. Uh, Justin talked about they always would mix their chemistry out here, out in that food plot somewhere, because if you spill it here, you could likely kill several of these trees, and that may not show up for two or three years. It's got to work through the soil, get in the root system, and that's got to go through the tree circulatory system. So got to be careful. You need to know what you're doing. This is one of those don't try at home, you know, warnings. But people do it, and a guy I went to school with, a lot of y'all probably heard his name, Craig Harper, Dr. Craig Harper. Craig was a couple years younger than me, behind me, and finished his PhD with the same professor I had just a couple years behind me. Craig's a good guy. And he did a lot of work, and he come up with, you can find this online, not to remember it, 50% Garlon 3A. A stands for amine, 40% water, mixed in that ratio, and then 10% Arsenal AC. AC stands for applicator's concentrate. There's some substitutes to that, but in that Amazapir family. And he did research, and they found that less than 1% of non-target trees were killed by using that and hack and squirt or double girdle after several years, not just one year. Uh, good research. Justin says he can get away with even less than 10% of mazapir. Yeah, pretty commonly. We just we do worry about root grafting. But again, I, I'm pretty conservative on that side. If, I, you know, if that means we miss one or two here, we can always come back and take a bite of that after again later. But, but that is a fantastic mix, and it works almost everywhere. I mean, anywhere across the southeast or midwest, that's... That is a pretty potent mix. Yeah. So there and are you others. Mix, that again, the Garlon 3A and the water first, because if you mix Garlon and any of the Mazapir chemistries, they're making a gel, gel. And it's a paste and it's 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 ugly. Uh, A 3A stands for amine. Amine is not very ground active. There's a Garlon 4, and that's an ester. And ester-based chemistries. I know y'all don't care about chemistry, but esters are more ground active than amines. So again, Justin uses a lot of four, Garlon four. They both work fine. That's where I'm a little bit more conservative. And I'm gonna use the 3A just to reduce the amount of ground activity. These are not arguments or right or wrongs. These are just different experiences, different, you know, we've had different training, different experiences. They both work just fine. And I'm always willing to learn new techniques. So. Fire with thinning the cedars or felling all the cedars produce a lot more tonnage than three fires without opening up the canopy. And I would not waste my time doing this on a big track of timber. Again, this little demo area, I just something I want to do. I'm crazy, I know. So this is another, by the way, great trapping area. We've caught a lot of coons and possums right here. Anytime you got a three-way and a food plot and this type of forest and that type of forest, a bunch of habitat edges, Predators are going to run those edges. 
And so we had traps right here and uh, removed some fur right here. So anything like this. So, so Grant, the, the mixture you're talking about for hack and squirt, effective on hickories too. Hickories are yeah. hard to kill. Hickory, yeah. Uh, you can soup up glyphosate, get the forestry label of that product and kill oaks, but you won't touch hickories or you, you, you won't kill a high percentage of them. So that 10% arsenal is mainly in there for the harder, more difficult hardwoods kill. And a lot of times we're talking hickories when we say that. Okay. So I've just got a ton of hickories and they, I know. they don't do any good. You have hickories, I have hickories because when people first come through here and cut the forest, the oaks were much more valuable. So they didn't take me to hickories. Hickories are prolific seed producers. Squirrels bury the seed or plant the seed, don't remove them all. So if you favor oaks, hickories are going to have the upper hand. And, and, and you come up with a hickory dominated forest. Uh, yeah. Green is the, uh, is the basil bark treatment I've read. Yeah, yeah. Is, is that as effective as packaged It can be, but hey, it takes more time, more chemistry. I mean, I'm putting, I'm a. Uh, if I'm personally hacking squirting this tree, I'm going to call this five, six inches. I'm not great at that. Uh, and I'm lazy, so I don't want to hack up here. Down here. I, I let the weight of the hatchet work. So my hatchets come down, and I'm not trying to cut the tree down. I'm not, you know, George Washington killing the apple tree. I'm just going through the bark. I want to get to that xylem and phloem, the cambium. So I got a pretty good hatchet. The steel ones are great. I want a wooden handle, a fiberglass handle. I don't want a metal handle. Or one day of doing this, and you have a severe case of tennis elbow. I can tell you from experience. <laughs> so you want something to take some of the vibration out. And I'm going to hack, just get through the bark. I'm going at 30 or 45 degrees. I'm making a cup. And I don't, the middle of this tree, middle of these hardwood trees are dead as a rock. Those cells are dead, and they're there for structural support. The living part here is that xylem or phloem or the circ the cambium, the circulatory system. Who's got a knife? The inner bark. Who's got a knife on you? Hopefully sharp. Here you go. Here you go. <laughs> I thought you were going to whip me out the dungee. Here, I got a knife. <laughs> <laughs> I should have said sharp knife. <laughs> See that? I know. Where's that steel they gave away? Who won that thing anyway? I'll give you five dollars for it. <laughs> <laughs> see that different color right there? You can't see it over there. That's the inner bark. That's what you want to get to. If you say you can, we got issues. <laughs> <laughs> That's the inner bark. And the inner bark is where, you, right below that, is where you want to get the herbicide. Thank you, Chris. And so I'm hacking at 30, 45 degrees. I'm not out here, you know, trying to get it that right. I'm making a cup, one squirt. I have tested a lot of spray bottles from Stuff Mart and other places. They're all about a milliliter or two per squirt. The recipe is one milliliter of that blend per hack. And one hack for each three inches of diameter. So I'm going to err on the heavy side. I'm saying this is five, call it six. Hack, squirt, hack, squirt, next tree. And y'all are used to spraying glyphosate in your food plots or yard and stuff's brown a week later. I'm not even gonna know this tree was hit except for my hacks for a while. The leaves won't start turning. Depending on the time of year, it may not be till the next year that I know it's dead. Remember, if I kill this tree here, it's probably falling out there. So I'm, this may be one hickory that survives, I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's hacking. This tree, I'm gonna call it over six inches. If I want to terminate it, I give it three hacks. That works as Justin said, from when the leaves are full size, the you know the sap is up. I like to stop. Justin said something different. I like to stop when the leaves start turning color, because I've had some cases where I didn't get a good kill after leaves are turning color, sap's going the wrong way, whatever. Uh, but then I can double girdle. There's trade-offs. Hack and squirt is really quick, not that much work. One guy can cover some land. Double girdle, I'm taking a chainsaw, that little steel pruner, whatever, a hatchet takes a lot of time. I'm cutting through the bark twice, wherever it's convenient for me, okay? And I'm using the back, if I'm using a little chainsaw, the back of saw, the front of a saw may kick, the back saw will pull me around the tree. So use the back of the saw, you mean a complete ring, don't leave an inch, because the sap will still go up that inch. Double girdle. 
and then I treat the top girdle. I do not know why, maybe Justin knows. I have a lot better success of termination in the top girdle than the bottom girdle. You can do that all winter long. You can do it any time of year. So no ticks out in the winter, leaves are off, a little tougher to identify trees if you don't know your bark well, uh, but it's pleasant working. In the summer, hack and squirt's easier. Less, less weight, not carrying around chainsaw. Uh, two people make this faster, one hacking or one chainsaw and one squirting, whatever. I always use blue herbicide dye, it's relatively inexpensive, and that way you know for sure that the tree was treated. If you just hack it and don't treat it, it's gonna do okay. So blue herbicide dye is a must for you. Blue herbicide dye will not work in your big 20-foot boom sprayer. It's so diluted, you'll never even know there's dye in there. 